All right. Hey, I did push the recording button. So yes, uh, we're ready to go from that standpoint. And hey, again, welcome everyone to the North Central uh, Climate and Drought uh, Summary and Outlook uh, for June. Uh, today, uh, oh, first of all, my name is Doug Cluck. I, I work for NOAA, the National Centers for Environmental Information, and with uh, a number of other folks, you can see some of their icons down below there. Beth Hall is going to be our presenter today. She's the Indiana State Climatologist, among other things, um, other great things, I should say. And um, before I turn it over to her, I want to remind folks that you can ask questions as we go along. So as things occur to you or questions come up in terms of um, what we're even talking about, um, um, please uh, use the question uh, uh, interface to, to, to ask us things. We'll try to get back to you either in line or on, online uh, as we go or at the very end. We'll have a Q&A session at the very end as well. We'll be joined a little bit later by uh, Dennis Toddy from USDA Climate Hub out of Ames, Iowa. Um, I'm based in Missouri, uh, Kansas City, Missouri, and Beth, it's all yours. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate the invitation to give this webinar. Uh, it is part of a monthly series that we have going on, and most of the time, state climatologists give this talk, and so this is my lucky month, and I'm honored to do it. I will go quickly through this. There's a lot to cover. I will say, though, that this intro slide, if you will, the picture, is part of the flooding damage that has recently occurred along the Yellowstone River within Yellowstone National Park. So we'll talk about that further, but boy, looking at that damage is pretty intense. As Doug mentioned, this is uh, this webinar series is a collaborative effort. You can see the list of the many partners that we have involved. It is a monthly series, so you get me today, but in a month, uh, Pete Boulay, the Minnesota Assistant State Climatologist, will be providing the webinar. If by any chance you want to share this webinar after the fact with others, there are multiple places where we post the recordings afterwards. Certainly drought.gov is an easy one to remember. The Midwestern Regional Climate Center also hosts these as well as the High Plains Regional Climate Center. Just a general outline, I'm going to first start off reviewing recent climate conditions for the last three months and then May. And then we'll talk about significant events that have occurred from severe weather, impacts with um, <laughs> agricultural impacts, hydrological impacts, and then wrap up the webinar with outlooks, both short term, July, summer, early fall, and then a brief mention of any impacts that um, the La Nina may have. So in talking about recent conditions, this is a photograph just from the Purdue College of Ag photo stock library, if you will, of an early stage cornfield. So agriculture is very important across our region. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But as we look at the last three months, this would be March through May. We'll start with temperature. The orange colors in the map or the reddish colors indicate that that three month period when we averaged the temperatures was warmer than the climatological normal or the average over the year period and then a cool shaded counties were cooler. So you can see for the eastern part of the Midwest central region, they were warmer. Uh, Northern Ohio had some particularly warm counties and then things are relatively normal as we move westward but then certainly notice the coolness that had occurred i'm going to draw your attention to north dakota in particular we have montana parts of minnesota and wyoming because that will help explain other factors that i'll discuss in a little bit as far as precipitation across that same three-month period it's somewhat of a mixed bag where if you look across the whole region, you see just a lot of pale blue colors and white. Uh, if you focus on those, it's very spotty and that's mostly because it was driven by perhaps storm tracks that came through, provided a lot of rain. We could conclude from this that in general across at least the eastern part of our region, 
precipitation was above normal. But I certainly want to draw your attention to those northern states again that on the previous map showed coolness. They also got a lot of uh, precipitation in that time. In fact, there were a couple counties in Minnesota that had their record wettest of that three month period and others I'm sure were in that top five. So that darker shaded group, uh, green area. For other parts of the West, you'll see the uh, brown color. So that was a deficit in precipitation and you'll see that highlighted more when we talk about drought in the US drought monitor. And then I also wanna draw your attention quickly up to the Montana area where that state had a nice combination of both wet counties and dry counties. When we hone in just on the month of May, May is looking a little bit different so that coolness that we had in North Dakota is gone. So North the Dakotas primarily in Nebraska were more in that normal temperature for the month. But most of those Eastern states, the average temperature across the month was above average, not record breaking. Um, just some places in Michigan were much above average, but in general, it, it was iffy, if you will. I mean, certainly above average, but nothing remarkable. And then if we look in counties of Wyoming and Montana, there were still areas that were below average. For precipitation, this is even more of a mixed bag for May, where you'll see brown or tan counties almost right up against those green counties. It shows that it really was not a broad area with the exception of the Minnesota, North Dakota, and parts of South Dakota area that has been oh, gifted, if you will, with lots of precipitation. And then if we look down into the Kansas, Missouri area, there's a group of heavy precipitation there. And then Ohio stands out with parts of Indiana. But Otherwise, we really can't say that there is a larger spatial extent. Even those dry areas seem to be weakening uh, once we got into May. We will highlight some of the dry areas for the southwest part of Colorado and Montana is still clinging on as well as northern part of the lower peninsula of Michigan. Last 30 days. So now we're saying really from that last um, webinar that was provided through today, temperature departures, we see that it has been on the cooler side. So these are uh, departures in degrees Fahrenheit. So those Northern states again have been cooler than average. And then the far Eastern side of our region, it's been warmer than average, but along that lower central region area, pretty normal. For precipitation, uh, again, it's somewhat spotty. We'll see that Kansas uh, eastern part has been very wet uh, over the last 30 days, but the western side has been drier with the exception of the Colorado-Kansas border. Also, I want to draw your attention to Ohio and how wet Ohio has been over the last 30 days. That has stood out a bit and has had impacts agriculturally. And then if we look at uh, Montana, again, particularly around where Yellowstone Park is, notice the extreme where we go from heavy precipitation in one parts of the state to very dry. So within single states, we can have extremes. So it's very difficult to look at this, again, from a spatially extensive way. And a lot of that's because storm tracks, it's just been very spotty across the area. Some areas just keep getting the storms and others are missing them. Moving on to issues and events. This picture is actually of downed power lines from a severe storm event that just passed through from Chicago well into Ohio a couple days ago, taking out power during this very hot period. And speaking of extreme heat, uh, this is just one map. I apologize, it's not for the entire central region, but it's just to highlight how many records have been broken. And this is for since the start of June. So from June 1st through this morning, where the icons are, the downward pointing pink means that this was a high minimum temperature. So if we think about the overnight, overnight lows have been very warm, record breaking. So uh, if it's the upward pointing red triangles, that means maximum daily highs. And then the black squares means both. And so looking at this, you could almost argue that pretty much every station 
uh, has had this. I will say that the majority of these records did occur within the last five days. If we look broader across the region, uh, this, this map is just showing one day. So the morning of June 14th, so that would have been um, Tuesday, we can see how hot it got in the Kansas, Nebraska area. Just to give you an idea of, this is just temperature, it's not even considering dew point. Some headlines, I believe yesterday at Chicago's Midway Airport, they reached 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and this was the first time since July 2012, and if you remember, that was when we had a significant drought, some call it a flash drought back then, so it's been almost 10 years since Chicago has had temperatures that high for any time of the year, not just June 15th. Uh, another thing to point out, that next bullet, consecutive days, TD is dew point temperature. So there's been several areas across the region where the dew point temperatures have exceeded 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and that is pretty remarkable. Uh, we like to think of dew point temperature as one of the stronger indications of humidity and mugginess, because that's pretty much saying as soon as the, out, the air temperature gets down to that dew point temperature, you're already saturated the air. So if we have temperatures in the 80s and 90s, but the dew point temperature is in the low 80s, we're pretty much near saturation, which is why we have that muggy feeling. Another thing that was pointed out is there's several locations across the region that have had uh, consecutive hours, 12 or more consecutive hours where just the air temperature was over 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And so if this is impacting the overnight hours, you can imagine the level of stress, um, health stress that we have on humans. Uh, this has been very stressful on livestock. There has already been significant loss of cattle in the uh, Kansas area. I think those numbers are still coming out, but we are talking tens of thousands potentially with this. Uh, but again, these are preliminary numbers. And then even animals, uh, and finally the energy. We probably heard of areas that are talking about strain on our electrical systems and having to uh, think about power, brownouts, if you will, or regulating the power a little bit better because it is such a high demand. Because of those high temperatures, air quality. We don't often talk about air quality during these webinars, but because this heat wave period has been so extraordinary, particularly for this time of year. It is having an impact on our air quality. Part of this is because if uh, you notice we've had been under a high pressure system, meaning the we have clear skies, we don't have a lot of rain passing through, the air we call it very stable, which means it's not moving a lot. We don't get a lot of vertical mixing let alone horizontal mixing, and so all of the pollution that's coming out from, say, air conditioning units, cars, et cetera, is just building up uh, around these areas, and also the clear skies bring sunlight in, and the sunlight can activate some of the chemicals in the atmosphere that can be toxic to us. So I wanted to highlight, and this is just of one day, this is of yesterday, but we've been in some concerning air quality levels for the last couple of days because of this heat event. Moving on to severe weather outbreaks, uh, this map is just one day that shows how active it's been, and pretty much every day in June and probably going back into May, we had uh, severe weather even on Memorial Day and prior to that. It has been active across our region. I think I had heard that even in South Dakota, they've had already 20 uh, preliminary reports of tornadoes, and it's early in the tornado season. Usually they don't get, like the average is 30 a year. So to already have that many tornadoes in South Dakota for the season is pretty remarkable. The picture on the left, in fact, is showing um, some tornado damage from one of those events. Hail has been another uh, concern with these severe weathers, and I found the picture on the left to be interesting just to try and put the size of these hailstones in perspective. This was from a hail event that occurred in Nebraska on June 11th, so not too many days ago. And then even in Minnesota, you see the damage to those structures from a storm that passed through in Memorial Day weekend. In addition to the classic severe weather uh, impacts, we also just have general wind impacts. It has been windier than 
normal when compared to the last 30 year mean 1991 to 2020 the map on the left where the warm colors are shows that the wind speeds have been greater than average I also want to highlight the picture in the top right that uh, shows blown down corn. This is in Ohio from a derecho, which is essentially a straight line wind event that passed through. And then the bottom right uh, image is a Twitter announcement out of the Chicago Romeoville Weather Service office that highlights the impacts that came out of that same June 13th storm that caused the derailed show in Ohio and also contributed to those down power lines in my opening slide. Moving on to hydrologic impacts, 28-day uh, stream flows are looking, so we'll just go look at current conditions over the past. Where there are green colors, that means the stream flow is relatively normal. Certainly, we though have our attention drawn to the blue dots on this map, and you see where Minnesota North Dakota, um, particularly Eastern and Eastern South Dakota are being highlighted as being very wet. Remember early on, I drew your attention to Ohio and how wet Ohio has been. And then we have the area down at the Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma um, area, tri-state area. They have been wet. Um, we're trying to see the impacts of the flooding of the Yellowstone River, but something I do want to point out before I get to the flooding along the Yellowstone River is again in Montana, you have a lot of green dots along the Yellowstone River, and then just not too far further north within that same state, we have those very deep red or um, dark red dots showing that there's very big extremes happening in that one state. The flooding though, so if we just start with northern Minnesota, so up along the Canadian border in particular where International Falls is, we have Rainy Lake, the river up there, they have gotten an extraordinary amount of precipitation. These pictures highlight some of the damage that has occurred from those rain events. And then the graph in the bottom left is accumulated precipitation since the beginning of the year for International Falls in Minnesota where that blue line that just really skyrockets in April and May shows how much rain they've gotten, not just out of one event, but some of these events have really pushed it above what has happened there in previous years. For that Yellowstone River flooding, so this was uh, the recent one just in the last couple of days, uh, the big problem is there was already quite a bit of snow on the ground. We bring in warm temperatures with that uh, remaining snow depth that's on the ground so that helped melt the snow and then we brought in rain so the combination of all of that had water runoff amounts equivalent to about 10 inches and it flooded things so the picture in the bottom left shows how it just totally washed out the road i believe this is the northern entrance to yellowstone national park you see in the other picture how bridges have been washed out You've probably been hearing stories about evacuations trying to take place. There's been a water plant along the uh, Yellowstone River that had to be shut down. This is all time record flow that has happened out of this. And it's just one of those perfect storms, if you will, that the timing, the temperatures, the amount of snow left on the ground prior to this just exacerbated the situation. Moving on to soil moisture, uh, we have a couple maps here. The one on the left uh, indicates what, like departure from what is normal. You can see the brown color. So in the Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado area, that indicates that the soil moisture is on the drier side. And where we've been highlighting up in Minnesota and North Dakota, it's been on the wetter side. Even Ohio still seems to be having um, long-term effects, if you will, of that precipitation that has impacted uh, things such as planting. The map on the right looks at this more in comparison to a five-year average, where essentially the blue shaded states indicate that that top soil, so very shallow level of the soil, is on the wetter side than what is typical, and anything shaded in yellow says it's on the drier side. Now, it's obviously you're losing detail when you're shading entire states like this, but it is um, highlighting really the perspective of the east versus west and where this could have impacts on agricultural progress. 
Evaporative drought demand index. So often when we talk about hydrology, we're thinking just precipitation, but we need to think of the whole water balance equation with this, where it's not so much what has come down, but what has evaporated. So this is an index, the evaporative drought, demand drought index or eddy, that incorporates how much has evaporated in addition to how much has fallen. And we can think of this more of the thirst of the atmosphere. And when we think of it that way, yes, North Dakota and parts of Minnesota, Wyoming are still on the wetter side, but now more of the West is on the drier side. This is a one month eddy map. They are a little late, um, not late, but behind. They don't update as often. So this is as of June 9th, but this highlights how the temperatures, those warmer than average temperatures that have been experienced, particularly in the Midwestern states, have in a sense offset a lot of the wetness, the rain that has fallen in that area. Stream flow runoff forecast. So this is highlighting for over the next three months, June, July, and August, where is there a greater than 50% chance of exceeding river flood levels? Anything that is green, pretty much we don't have to worry about. I mean, yes, there's always a chance, but it's in that normal uh, framework. But again, we see where there is highlighted oranges and reds down in the Missouri area. And then up in South Dakota, North Dakota, we're seeing some oranges. This is probably because the streams are already high, uh, certainly not high of concern. But when we do get convective storms coming over that area, those convective storms can just dump a lot of rain. And when I say convective, I mean more like these pop-up thunderstorms that can generate a lot of rainfall in a very localized area. Moving on to the Great Lakes for hydrology, uh, not too much to say here. The map on the right just shows where temperatures are at. We do, I want to point out though the warm temperatures for Lake Erie and the southern tip of Lake Michigan. This isn't necessarily extraordinary. We would expect that the southern parts of these lakes will be warmer, but with warm lake temperatures we do have raised concerns then about the outbreaks of harmful algal blooms. So the graph on the left is a model that is produced that looks at the risk of a harmful algal bloom outbreak uh, for 2022. And that red bar is showing that it's certainly not nothing, it's certainly not low, but we still believe that that risk is less severe than last year. So as long as precipitation stays normal, the assumption or the prediction at this point is the harmful algal bloom outbreak should be more like along what we saw in 2020, which from that chart you could see was significantly lower than 2021. In terms of lake levels, uh, they are falling well within normal range. So these four maps are highlighting the four uh, Great Lakes. The top right one combines Lake Michigan and Huron together. To get an idea of how to read this, the thick black dots uh, are measurements that represent the long-term average. And so if you just follow the continuous black line, Wherever that continuous black line fell below the thick black dots, that means lake levels were below the long-term average. But you can see that essentially where we are currently, which is right where the colorful blooms start, if you will, blooms start, uh, all, all the lakes are above the long-term average, but still far from the maximum. And finally, the U.S. Drought Monitor was just released this morning. Uh, they're showing spotty areas in the Midwest states of abnormally dry conditions. The West has been battling with various levels of drought, and so we still see that lingering with the exception of Minnesota and North Dakota. I will highlight, though, with this, that even though the Midwest at this point is looking good, if you will, depending upon how you want to characterize good, this spotty nature of abnormal dryness, if we were to continue to get very warm temperatures and low precipitation, this could be a bad situation that is setting up. So it is something that we want to keep an eye on and monitor because we're already seeing small areas, isolated areas of dryness, and that could change rather quickly. 
This is a change map, just looking uh, four weeks, so about a month, pretty much since the last webinar to see how has the current map compared to back then. Anything that's shaded green means this has been an improvement, meaning any drought levels have been lifted by a category or more. And then any yellow areas, uh, gold shows that we have introduced drought or it has increased. Moving on now to agricultural impacts. And this is just a, a stock photo from University of Purdue's um, files, if you will, of an early stage soybean field. Winter wheat. So winter wheat was not as great as perhaps we would have liked to have seen. Uh, Dennis is on and he can probably speak far better about these plots at the end or put them in the question and answer area, but we see all those brown and dark brown states means that the um, bushels or percentage was lower than the previous year. However, I will highlight that in some states such as Illinois, Wisconsin, when that change is just by one or two uh, less, that that probably isn't going to impact things. In fact, if I show you this chart, you'll see where we're looking at in terms of bushels per acre for 2022 of winter wheat. And yes, that amount of 48.2 is less than the trend yield, but that is still higher than many years prior to that. So it's certainly not the type of yield that we would love to see, but I wouldn't think that it's too bad and it's gonna be very dependent upon where you're located. When we think about corn and soybean progress, these maps are showing the percentage that has emerged. And in general, the Midwest states are doing well. Green is saying that they are ahead of um, the five-year average. Orange states are lightly yellowed, are behind, but again, these are very light shadings. So probably at this point in the growing season, not too much concern. If you're like me, you're like, what's going on with North Dakota in both of these cases? And that really is affiliated with the fact that it was so wet and so cool uh, early on that it delayed planting for one thing. So then obviously the percent that has emerged at this point, if they uh, had to wait so long to get it in the fields, is gonna have an impact. And then just the amount of rain could have deteriorated the quality of the fields when they wanted to plant. Oats and spring wheat, you can see the progress there. I will move past this just for the sake of time. And pastures, uh, the percent that is in good to excellent, a lot of those on the eastern side of our region are doing great. There are some concerns on the western side, certainly drought related, uh, and I will let Dennis address this at the end. Going on to wildfire, not too much to say about this. This is a close-up picture of a fire that just occurred within the last couple of days in southwest Kansas. And what's interesting is you can see certainly the burn scars or the burn marks on the ground, but because corn was already planted, it um, helped preserve that, if you will. There was enough greenness in the corn, but the cover crop that had remained is that fuel that likely took off. And here's another picture of that fire that occurred on June 13th. Moving on to outlooks, what, what do we think is going to happen? I want to start off with the status of ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. There are three phases to this, La Nina, Neutral, and El Nino, and we've really been in the La Nina phase for quite a while now. And looking at this chart, uh, we evaluate what phase we're in in three-month chunks. So down at the bottom, when you see MJJ, that's uh, May, June, July, and then JJA, June, July, August, and so forth. And the blue bars is essentially the probability that a La Nina is going to occur. And then gray is neutral and red is La Nina. So as you move across those three-month periods, you see that those red bars are very, very small, indicating that we have very little probability, confidence that an El Nino is going to develop over this time. This goes all the way out to the January, February, March period. And really La Nina is the one that's dominating amongst those three phases in terms of what we believe will be sticking around. Now, as we move forward the next couple of months throughout the um, summer and early fall, it prob that La Nina will weaken. You can see how that neutral phase is catching up with it in that July, August, September period. 
But then once we start progressing into the winter, we expect that the probability of La Nina happening increases again. Our forecast, so just going out seven days, uh, this you can see the legend here, for the most part, across the region, the amounts that are being predicted are considerably low. We do have the little blue blob, if you will, in that Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, Missouri intersection area. But other than that, there's too much white in my mind, indicating no rain, and then that pale green. So we're looking at very little precipitation amounts. I, we also have some highlighted areas in Montana and Colorado. But even with these small amounts, keep in mind with temperatures increasing as we get further into the summer, that's increasing our evapotranspiration rates, which goes back to this idea of the water balance, that it's, we got to think of how much fell, but then also how much evaporated. And we are looking at a strong situation over the next seven days, if not further, that more moisture will be evaporating from the ground that will be falling, that will be exacerbating our risks for drought to develop, if not rapidly intensify. The eight to 10 day outlook. So this is starting about a week from today out for a week after that. The, map on the left is showing our level of confidence in temperature. So the warm colors is warmer than normal temperature and the darker that warm color is the greater the confidence that we have that temperatures over that period will be above normal. Across our entire region, with the exception of a little sliver in the Upper Peninsula, we are thinking that temperatures will be above normal. We have some pretty good confidence, particularly in the southern part of our region. For precipitation, that poor Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota area, um, there is slight confidence that the precipitation over that period will be above normal. And then over in the more Eastern Midwest states, it is going to be dry. And if you recall back earlier when I showed the drought monitor has these spotty areas of abnormally dry conditions already, we're looking at this forecast here or this outlook and saying, wow, if this warm and dry continues, could we be looking, could we be looking at a rapid intensification of drought in this area? For the month of July, that temperature story is a bit different. So instead of temperature, us having a um, level of confidence that the entire region will be warmer than normal, that warmer than normal area is really just shifted for the southern and the eastern parts of the central region. The northern parts, equal chances, and really what that means is, you know, it could be an equal chance it's below normal, above normal, or around normal. So there's very little guidance for the northern part of our region for temperature. For precipitation, this drought, this dry, this confidence, or we're favoring drier than normal conditions across the core of our region with greater confidence in the southern part of the central region. Um, again, it's of concern. We want to keep an eye on that. However, all around that to the north, east, and west, we just don't have any guidance really one way or the other. So, and that, that blob in the middle could always shift in time. And then looking out seasonally, the July, August, September period, that um, above normal temperature seems to have expanded much more with the exception of the far northern it states, such as North Dakota and parts of Montana and Minnesota, the confidence of above normal is on the weak side for the majority of the region, but it is something to keep in mind that a lot of this could be driven by that La Nina signal sticking around. Uh, the west, the eastern and western part though of the central region, that confidence increases. For precipitation over this three month period, a majority of the region is showing or favoring below normal precipitation. So in those Western states that are already been facing drought conditions, this could be bad news. And for anything in the Eastern side that's been teasing abnormally dry conditions, combine that with the increased temperatures, this could be a, a situation of concern and we should be preparing now. The drought outlook. So this is where the um, we look out three months, so through the end of September to see what do the models predict in terms of drought and where the gold shading is, that's where the models are currently anticipating drought to develop. So in one sense, the good news is it's not the entire Midwest, but 
Illinois. It seems to really like L Illinois for that matter and parts of Iowa. Uh, for some reason, the models are favoring that area and a lot of it can do with where it is dry now. It's just going to continue to get dry because the soils are dry and there is a positive feedback mechanism when you have dry soils, high temperatures and no precipitation. Wildfire, um, these are projected one month at a time. So for June, July, and then on the far right is August where there is red shading that is indicating above normal risk of wildland fire outbreaks. Uh, wildland fire is distinguished from prescribed burns in this case, can be both human or naturally caused or lightning caused. And you see that as we go throughout the season that potential increases likely due to that um, increase of the increased probabilities of warmer temperatures and drier conditions. So in summary, when we think back at where we have been, the May temperatures were near normal in the northern states, warmer in the Midwest. Precipitation was near normal or slightly war wetter than normal with the exception of those far northern states. And where there was cooler or wetter conditions, uh, that did have an impact on agricultural production in terms of planting and then therefore emergence. And ongoing flooding issues for the Red River, James River, Northern Minnesota. We'll see how the Yellowstone River <laughs> unfolds. I think that could be for a while too. And then our outlooks, we do anticipate La Nina conditions to continue, though it will probably weaken for the next couple of months and then likely strengthen after that. And regardless of the period we're looking at, in general, uh, the models are favoring uh, warmer than normal temperatures. Uh, in very particular areas, uh, drier than normal conditions with too much uncertainty elsewhere. So I don't want to suggest that elsewhere it's not going to be drier than normal. We just don't have a lot of confidence one way or the other. So there could be a rapid intensification of drought and any flooding issues. We're probably going to be seeing those coming out of these convective or more localized storm events. Here's a page with a lot of links on it. I know if you're watching this, it's not very helpful, but if you want to view the recorded of, uh, re recording of this in the future, you can see these links. And I will finish or just keep this page up uh, until Doug tells me to take it down. Of uh, A variety of us involved with this call where you can reach out. Again, um, my name is Beth Hall, the Indiana State Climatologist and Director of the Midwestern Regional Climate Center. Dennis Toddy is a great resource for agricultural questions that you might have. Doug Cluck, who organizes these webinars, can help answer questions or get you in touch with the right person. Melissa is with the Midwestern Regional Climate Center. Brian Fuchs is the National Drought Coordination Center, National Drought Mitigation Center. So when we talk about concerns with drought, he could be a good resource. And then Gannon Rush is with the High Plains Regional Climate Center. So with that, Doug, I will hand it back to you. All right. Hey, thank you very, very much, Beth. <laughs> Once again, too much to cover, too little time, but that's the way it goes. Uh, we have a number of questions. Uh, can you back up to the uh, drought outlook, please? Okay, so I think I want to start here uh, before we get too hard into the questions. And maybe Dennis can help me address this a little bit, too, since he uh, listened in on the, the, some of the reasoning behind this. But um, one thing I just want to point out very quickly is that uh, you, uh, pr although precipitation is a big deal when it comes to whether drought occurs or not, it's not the only deciding factor. So we can actually have drought develop in areas with normal precipitation, or even, even above pre uh, normal precipitation, if temperatures are above normal and we just see uh, crops, for example, deteriorate um, even though they've gotten some decent moisture in that period of time. Now, one of the things we want to hit, hit pretty hard this time is the uh, likelihood, I'll put it that way, of, of, of a drought appearing in what we call sometimes a, a, a flash drought or something that happens over a, a, a one or two week period when temperatures are above normal, We've got some wind with it and plants and everything else are really drawing out a, a, a heck of a lot of um, uh, moisture from the soils. 
and they're not getting replenished with regular precipitation. And that can cause some, some stress. And this is more of a dentist uh, uh, angle and, and Beth angle than mine. But I wanted to sort of bring that to the forefront so we can start there. Um, there are also going to be issues in terms of heat health uh, with with plants, and, well, plants obviously, animals and, and humans over the next couple of weeks. Um, we're looking at temperatures well above normal, especially in the Southeast US, but that's gonna be reaching up into the Midwest solidly uh, for over the next two weeks. Uh, uh, and, and then you're also looking at those maps for uh, predictions, I will say, uh, in July, and then the July, August, September timeframe, all calling for that similar area to be above normal in terms of temperatures and such as well. So uh, it does look like it's, uh, summers are hot, okay? That's the way it goes, we get it. Um, but some summers are <laughs> more, a little more extreme than others in terms of that heat. So that's what we're sort of watching right now. We were kind of waiting for this flip to occur and flip from basically normal to slightly cooler than normal and it looks like we're we're in the midst of it now um now um i can either do uh, uh qu comments or qu uh, anything you want to say dennis or beth at that point and then i'll get to the questions okay. oh go ahead beth oh, i said i'm good dennis do you have it a reminder about this product it is comparing where we are right now with where we are at the end of September. That's it, we're, we're dealing with the endpoints only. And then the reason this is drawn the way it is here is that that area along the Mississippi River and up into Illinois is somewhat drier when you look at precipitation maps and soil moisture maps. It doesn't mean the Missouri, Arkansas, that area in the middle isn't going to see drought, it's just that uh, that area has had some more recent precipitation, so the drought may not show up as quickly at this point. Okay. All right. Anything you want to say about flash drought, Dennis, please? <laughs> um, rapid intensification or flash drought. Um, Doug said, you know, summer is hot, but when you are warmer than average and uh, have sunny skies, lots of wind, lower relative humidity, the atmosphere puts more demand or wants to use more water out of a crop, that can add on problems very quickly, can add distress to a crop. If you've got soil moisture to draw from, plants can handle this for a while. If your soil moisture is a bit more limited, the problems will show up sooner. That's why, you know, that Illinois area and Trent Ford has been mentioning that he had concerns in Illinois that when hot temperatures showed up, if they didn't start getting rainfall, they could start seeing stress showing up fairly quickly. Yep, and 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 we really got to remember that soil moisture factor and using up that reservoir pretty quickly during uh, these really hot times. So, um, moving on to the questions really quick, someone was asking: Does anybody do analysis or keep track of monthly, yearly uh, records on being broken over time? And 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 absolutely, that is the case. Um, I did put an EPA site up there because I couldn't, couldn't find mine really quick. But uh, there, yeah, so the, we do keep track of, uh, of records. Uh, both the, the regional climate centers do too, where Beth is located. Uh, that's why she was able to show you that nice uh, map with all the record uh, temperatures and such. Um, so, yeah, and, and one of the things you would see if we compared record highs to record low uh, uh, trend over time is you'd see by far the number of records we're, we're hitting on the high side is much greater than those we're hitting on the low side. In other words, low temperature records are more rare now um, than ever before. And that's, the, that's, that's a, a symptom, if you will, of climate change. So let's, yeah, go ahead. Doug, Doug you should also say higher high temperatures, yep, but also should. higher low temperatures, right, higher right. overnight temperatures. We're setting records. Yep. Uh, yeah. Minimum temperatures in, in, is, is what we're talking about. Uh, or high high minimum temperatures in, the, in that case. So uh, La Nina has, uh, the question was, has La Nina been the dominant teleconnection so far this growing season? And yes, it has from a 
ENSO, in other words, if you're saying El Nino neutral or La Nina, which are the three, you could be one of those three, um, it has been the dominant one. When it comes to, is it the dominant one making our weather the way it is? That's a little bit different question. So uh, there are times when, and, and I don't have an answer to that, maybe Dennis or, or, or uh, Beth would like to chime in, but I don't know what the dominant teleconnection overall has been in terms of forcing, if you will, um, across across the U.S. Uh, or even the north central part of the U.S. Um, Dennis, do you want anything, anything there? Or any, yeah, or feel free to comment if someone else would comment on that. Um, there and are I other things. I, can, yeah, I can't, I can't add too much more to that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's a complicated factor because if El Nino, or in this case, La Nina is 15% of the equation, you know, that's 85% of the equation that we that that has to be figured out in terms of other things like Arctic oscillation, okay, which is just another teleconnection, but affects us on a shorter time scale. So I, I um, that's a better question for my CPC friends. I, I um, actually, um, we had a question f about derecho wind damage and all that kind of stuff. Dennis, go ahead on that one in terms of comparison to damage. Yeah, there's there's really no comparison at this point. Uh, the 2020 derecho occurred in the middle of the growing season when you had standing crops, and actually the winds were worse in that one than we saw this spring. Uh, this spring happened uh, either before things were planted or before things were emerged, so the crop damage was very small. And then um, another uh, question about, is this third La Nina in a row that, well, we're not quite there yet, but if we were to have a La Nina this fall winter, how rare is that to have three of those? And we usually look at them over the cool, cooler season in terms of, uh, of checking that box. I'll just put it that way. Uh, how rare is that? And so I think we said this on the last call, but I, it's the, it's, this will be the third time since 1950 that we've seen that, that happen. Um, so it's rare, it's rare, but not unheard of. Okay, and and if you ask me why, boy, that's a that's probably a trillion dollar question. And and to add on to that, why we consider 1950 is because we have satellite and some other gauges of El Nino, La Nina that start about 1950. There are some other estimates of El Nino events that go farther back, right. just right. using pressure. Uh, so we could probably find some more examples using that, but they 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 are not an exact one to one comparison because it's a little bit different gauge of El Nino and La Nina conditions. Right. And are storm systems from the Gulf of Mexico and, and the Atlantic expected to bring precipitation to the center of the country? La Ninas are associated. Yes. So yes, you're correct. La Nina, when La Ninas occur, there is a uh, a higher likelihood of more activity. Uh, more, uh, I should say, tropical storm activity in the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic. Um, so, yes, we expect that. That was the official outlook this year. And thus, there is a higher likelihood, but absolutely no guarantee that uh, that those those events, once they weaken and move on land, obviously they bring a lot of precipitation, could bring uh, substantial rainfall like it did in 2012 and saved a lot of crops that year in, in August, I think it was. But again, uh, all it means is more activity doesn't necessarily mean they're going to make it up to the Midwest. Um, a Beth and Atta, Atta girl, uh, this was a great webinar, very thorough and concise. Um, uh, so there you go. Comment. Um, uh, a comment out of Kentucky, uh, simply saying that uh, uh, Kentucky had a relatively dry spring. Uh, cool, cool conditions prevented drought from occurring. Now with the heat, things are going to get bad in a hurry. And and I, <laughs> uh, Dennis, do you want to talk about the cool temperatures this spring and how it, if you will, saved some areas and made some areas worse in terms of drought? Well, I, the the cool spring again, reduced the amount of atmospheric demand or how much evaporation was going to happen from the surface. 
it slowed down planting because temp because soil temperatures weren't warm enough, but it did uh, reduce some of the evaporation from some of the soils, and it actually helped produce some wet-ish conditions in some areas because uh, Illinois and some of the eastern Corn Belt, uh, they actually had frequent rainfalls, but there were frequent light rainfalls. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so we, the soils were actually able to get somewhat wet uh, because they weren't evaporating. Then once we started getting warmer temperatures, they evaporated pretty quickly. Here's a great question. Uh, I, 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 how are the reservoir capacities in the Missouri River doing now that with the flood flood water? A couple great uh, and something we should expand upon a little bit because there's a, you know, Montana was the epicenter and still is, by the way, there is D4 drought, which is the worst case scenario drought. Literally. Uh, 50 to 100 miles north of where that flooding just occurred. And they just have missed it and missed it and missed it. And, um, uh, uh, but in terms of reservoir capacity, it, it was it was really terrible what happened in Yellowstone and, and downstream through Red Lodge and in Billings in terms of the damage, okay? But in terms of overall water capacity, there's a lot of capacity in those giant reservoirs. And so, yes, it was helpful, it was helpful to help fill some of the uh, drawdown, I guess you could say, to some of those reservoirs, but it, it, it's not a final solution in terms of all the reservoirs being fine, okay? They're, um, they're so big, it would take several of those <laughs> events, and, and not that we want to see them, uh, several of those events over a period of time uh, to, to really do make a big switch, if you will, in the reservoir system in the Missouri. And, and I hope I got that right. And if somebody from the Corps wants to comment, please feel free in terms of what adjustments that has made. And, and, and oh, I should also mention the Bureau of Rec dams, which are the smaller dams on the uh, further up the river, um, are doing all right now, um, whereas they, there were some worries in terms of uh, low waters and such. The, the Bureau of Rec person who was on our call yesterday specifically indicated that Garrison had ample capacity to take in the, the water that was coming down out of the Yellowstone. It, it's going to be helpful. No, no two ways about it. Um, it seems Nebraska has had a consistent pattern of large damaging hail in June. Our records kept to compare this year's damage with averages or extreme years. Um, we certainly have, we have uh, records on, um, I don't know about, we do have records on damage to a degree, um, but in terms of Number of events. We also have records on um, on the number of events per month um, in each state. So yeah, that kind of uh, information is is uh, is available. But the variation in that is immense. Uh, so one year may have very very few or none, uh, whereas the next year may have a nearly record number of of of, of damaging uh, hail events. That kind of thing. Um, I don't know if anybody would like to say, do you want to say anything about that, uh, uh, Dennis or anyone else? And th there are records of that. And, and Kevin, if you need that, feel free to write me and I'll work uh, with the folks to get you that information. Um, insurance companies definitely have that information. <laughs> uh, and uh, or let me also mention May and June are prime prime seasons for severe weather. So all that severe weather stuff that uh, Beth showed, yeah, we're probably uh, uptick above normal. Um, and, and this is sort of off the cuff me saying this, but in terms of number of events this year, but it is, we are in prime time in terms of uh, severe weather times. Is there, uh, is there anticipated to be a heat dome? Oh, uh oh, it's a good question for you, Dennis. In the Central Plains and Corn Belt in 2022, similar to the Heat Dome in the Northern Plains in 2021 uh, and 2012 drought. Right now, we see um, heat coming in in week two. If you look at the week three to week four outlooks from the Climate Prediction Center, they don't hold that as far north. I don't believe, if I recall what we saw from last Friday, the Southern Plains and, mm -hmm. and Southern U.S. have probably a better chance of that stick, uh, you know, building in right now. Uh, we're not done with it. 
we're not done with the heat. Um, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, I don't, we can't say right now uh, that we would end up, I mean, 20, 2012 was, was huge. Um, and I'm not sure we can say that it would look something like that. Uh, Northern Plains doesn't seem to be at as much risk right now. Okay. Um... I um, apologize if anybody was kicked out, by the way, a couple of people that we know, uh, or at least one of them got kicked out and couldn't get back in. So I apologize if that ever happened to anyone. Final, uh, final question, and it's a good question again. Are there maps that correlate extreme heat with health impacts? And um, I'm going to say yes, but I would have to dig unless someone else has that information or someone on the webinar wants to uh, offer that information on where that would be. Um, I imagine that is um, health and human services types information and state level stuff. Doug, there, there is a developing group that I have to go find the acronym yeah. for again, that I think is NOAA related. Yes. Um, it's it's called it this National Integrated Health and Heat. Yes. Yep. Yes. That. Yep. That one. So, uh, Dorothy, uh, I would if you want to send me a quick email on that, uh, or any of us really. Uh, yes, NIHIS. Thank you. Uh, National Integrated Heat Health Information System. You can Google that to start with, and if you find out what you wanted or find out what you want out of that. Um, and I guess I need to write here. Let me. Uh... Okay, Dennis, are you putting? Okay, thank you, thank you. You're putting it in the live section. Yeah, and that's um, that's to get at this. This I won't say. I'll say it's growing to the in the point that we're having more heat related issues. But uh, it's always been an issue. Heat kills more people than anything else in terms of weather and climate. So um, it's recognized, and it's only going to get worse. And this is an effort to to help with that information to some degree. OK, um, that is it. And we are right at two o'clock. I want to thank everybody very much for hanging in there. If you have other questions, things come up during during the month uh, before our next uh, talk. And I don't remember the date. Uh, help me out here. Um, is it the 20th of July, the third Thursday? When is it? 21st. 21st. The third Thursday of July is the 21st. So. Yeah, we'll have um, our friend from Minnesota on here doing the talk. Beth, you did a great job, of course, as we expected you would. And uh, Dennis, thanks for chipping in. We did introduce you at the beginning, Dennis, with the USDA Ag Hub. Uh, Beth Hall, the Indiana State climatologist. Thank you all. See you next month. Have a great day.